Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization in the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-hosts. Vivica Ernst. And Brian Crane. Lovely to have you here. And we have this opportunity uh, to be sitting down with Vitalik Buterin. Hi. Hey, Vitalik. Thanks for doing this. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great. So the last time we sat down at ATC was two years ago. In was 2021. It two years ago, not last year? No, we didn't do it. I don't think we okay. did. Okay, oh, right, right. There was a, you know. It was in this, this great studio with, mm-hmm. remember, like the screens yeah. and yep, the whole yep. camera setup and everything. Very different setup, but mm-hmm. nonetheless, uh, we're very fortunate to be here and we're very pleased to be in your presence. It was a different different time. Mm-hmm. This was the, at the height of uh, crypto euphoria. How have things been since then? And uh, how do you how do you feel about the ecosystem generally? I mean, you know, it's definitely a little bit less... Uh, euphoric now but uh you know after the u4 you always have u5 and u6 and u7 and you just have to like you know do a bunch of hard work and uh i feel like that hard work's actually been happening like from a dev perspective you know we yeah had the merge then um you know on the road to doing dang sharding you know zk evms kind of actually exist um just the yeah decentralized um or semi-decentralized and of Ethereum based social media that I talked about at ECC two years ago kind of actually exists. Yeah, like it does actually yeah, feel like a lot of stuff has been done. So I I don't know. I feel satisfied. Great. And uh yeah, what what did you uh most appreciate about ECC this year? What what are your major highlights? I felt like EFC or or I guess kind of greater EFCC, so like everything that's been happening in Paris this week did a good job of kind of being coherent and uh, being well organized together. Like I remember last year there were a lot of uh, cases where I had to like go Uber bike 25 minutes to go to like some side event and like that happened multiple times. And uh, this time like everything is much closer together, Uh, but this time there was like a bigger selection of interesting stuff like it's uh, it seems fairly you know planned out to kind of not interfere with each other too much right and uh you know there's uh, a lot of different things for different people i mean obviously you kind know, of the you know the core efcc itself has uh expanded a bunch like you've you've taken over like the the neighbor building too now right yeah I, at least i saw that on the map I don't know. yeah there's there's now two Two buildings, which is yeah, no, no, it's uh, and an extra day. <laughs> good, yeah, like it so. feels it feels like it's uh, doing a good job of uh, scaling while at the same time not becoming terrible, which is like a harder problem than it seems. But you know, it seems like you know, you're doing a good job of it. Yeah. Uh, has there been anything uh, that I don't know surprised you or like new that you've learned that kind of has maybe yeah changed your thinking or risen some kind of new curiosity well last week uh, justin told me about how you can do um, complicated zk snark protocols just using lookups and i thought that was really cool oh oh, oh, you mean about the event um (laughs) (laughs) yeah no it's a it's a good question like it's always there there's like never one thing it's always a combination of uh a whole bunch of things but like the general impression i get is just um of you know continued ongoing progress in uh, pretty much every area i as we talked about this before we uh, started the interview um none of us has actually seen any talks other than our own i assume yeah, i have seen some i mean i saw i saw metallic star for a, for a couple <laughs> for a couple of minutes for um which ones did you see brian i saw the gnosis pay talk Oh, oh yeah. I saw the Stakewise talk. Then we had two team members from Corresponding Eve talks, one about staking and one some Eve staking mm-hmm. tool. And I saw your talk. So it's like five. <laughs> there were a bunch of announcements. So are there are there any things where you feel like you you will need to ke- uh, catch up one, once you're like uh, uh, in your hotel room again? Good question. I'm I'm sure I will. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm look for looking forward to you know hearing the things that have been announced. While, you know, continuing to be uh, in the process of talking, helping to coordinate the whole account abstraction effort and researching, um, you know, and getting a better understanding of proof of personhood protocols and doing a bunch of other stuff. But I'm, uh, I will get I will get to 
um, learning what the announcements are in uh, acceptable due time, I promise. So maybe we can get into the topic that it feels like it's been kind of the, the dominant topic in uh, crypto for a while. So the topic of MEV and this whole thing of like MEV pipeline and what this all look like. I'm curious, what is your, if you know, I like kind of think like zoom out and think far ahead and, you know, you think sort of in Ethereum in a state of, you know, maturity and stability uh, and the sort of end game, what do you feel like that should look like? Yeah, it's a good question. It's definitely one that uh, lots of people this week in various places have been talking a lot about. I, I mean, one of the big directions that we've been moving in for the last couple of months is the whole enshrined PBS um, thing. And like, we're actually taking this uh, market where proposers can uh, like ba- basically yeah, auction off the yeah, contents of their block to other um, more specialized actors and uh, put that whole thing into the core protocol so that we don't have to deal with the yet yeah, you know, extra complexity and trust requirements of things like relays. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, interesting and uh, going to be uh, important. There's the whole question of like what the market will look like on the yeah, builder side and if like you'll have monolithic bird builders or builders and searchers uh, coordinating with each other or something else. And like for that, I don't know, I guess we'll see the cross domain mev issue is interesting right like that was uh, always described as like the big reason why you might need to like share proposer infrastructure across different domains and like why you might need even more complicated mev constructions and like i feel like there's some probability that that's true and there's always some probability that it just turns out not to be a problem like basically yeah the intuition for why would be that like MEV involving a price discrepancy between Arbitrum and Optimism can always be decomposed into like a separate price discrepancy between Arbitrum and Binance and the price discrepancy between Optimism and Binance. And so you don't actually have to like be on both chains. You just have to be like be on one chain and be on Binance. And like that's uh, like that's always been sort of the theoretical argument for why it ma- might matter less than it uh, sort of theoretically seems. But like, I don't know, right? Like it's uh, possible that in uh, two years, um, you know, the centralized exchanges will all be like either banned or dead for various reasons, or or they'll just fail and be out competed. Even if you want to be on the bright side, and uh, the yeah price discovery itself would happen, um, you know, on chains. In which case, that would look like even more different. Yeah, like I think it's uh, important still to keep an open mind to like future possibilities of how the um, market turns out and try to create infrastructure that's as robust to those different possibilities as possible. You know, what are sort of the desirable characteristics of that end state? You know, does it, you know, yeah. for example, in terms of economic value or I don't know, some other properties that you want to be yeah. maintained? I guess like I've, I've never been much of a finance guy in the sense that like, I honestly don't give a damn if the, uh, trading spreads for a mil- for converting a million dollars of ETH to USDC are 0.2% or 0.43%. Um, my yeah, biggest uh, concern is like whether or not this uh, creates an externality that will, um, you know, accentualize staking, right? Like basically, yeah, if it creates incentives by which, um, you know, larger stakers are benefited disproportionately from smaller stakers, that creates pressure to create bigger staking pools. It creates pressure to join existing ones. It might even create pressure for the the decentralized staking pools to become less decentralized. Like it creates all kinds of nasty effects, right? And this is all part of a yeah, larger picture, right? Because the MEV ecosystem is not the only thing threatening staking decentralization, right? Like just uh, the yeah, existing, I mean, no bad user, exper- um, user experience of staking as it exists today, which can only be improved with... Uh, like basically imp- improvements to technology and just like a better code and better interfaces. There is the whole restaking issue and, um, you know, the whole issue of using stake as collateral and like the whole question of like whether or not, um, you know, staking large amounts can be safe and like does it involve distributed validators, right? Like there's all of those concerns and I feel like the MEV ecosystem is only one of them. And so I really hope that we can you know, continue to make a, yeah, like a highly yeah, decentralized staking ecosystem possible. And 
it's like important to you know recognize all of the pressures that might be going against that and do a, 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 as good a job as uh, we can of addressing them. Do you think consolidation is not like is inevitable though? I mean, look at the way global finance is consolidating, major corporations are consolidating sort of in, in the tr- traditional world. Do you think that those dynamics are also, you know, mm-hmm. to some extent in- inevitable on chain? Like basically the question of, uh, you know, whether or not uh, decentralization is fundamentally impossible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, I mean, the thing that is possible is that, uh, um, like maintaining decentralization will require incentives other than in protocol hard coded coded incentives. I mean, just the morals of ecosystem participants is like one example. Um, another example uh, of things that can cause more decentralization is, uh, I mean, sometimes regulatory pressure causes it. Um, sometimes, like if protocols end up, um, you know, having things like public goods funding, then like that funding can, um, you know, intentionally subsidize everything but the largest staking pool, right? So, like, there definitely is a possibility where like hard coded stuff is not enough, and we have to like start actively doing more, I guess, soft coded things. Yeah, so I think what we've seen a lot is kind of people going for liquid staking solutions mm-hmm. because you get the liquid staking derivatives, which you can then use again. Something uh, this, which ben- I mean, a very tangible benefit that you don't have if you kind of stake yourself or stake with a very very small staking provider. Do you think there's a way of kind of um, making a consortium of kind of home stakers and small stakers and so on that they can kind of issue their own? Um, liquid staking tokens and so kind of mm-hmm. preserving the decentralization while at the same time yeah. not putting opportunity mm-hmm. costs on the people who are actually there to right. be the decentralization? Yeah, and I think it's the the challenge with that, right, is that you would have to have some kind of like trust system involving who's allowed to participate, right? Because that's like from the point of view of an attacker who wants to break the chain, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, you like so that attacker would of course want to join this system and they because... Uh, if they join this system, then like they would be able to go and like use the thing as collateral, like take out some other stuff, and then they would not like suffer the full cost of being slashed anymore, right? Yeah. So if they do that, like if they're able to do that, then like you know, like basically attacking the protocol becomes cheap, much cheaper, and the yeah, of course, in that case, the staking protocol itself is going to end up losing a lot of money, right? Like basically, all the honest participants would, right? So. In that case, you would need to um, have some off-chain way of like filtering out, like basically trying to only let. Maybe one way to frame it is to let good guys and don't let bad guys into the staking protocol. But like another way to frame it is to like put a max on the participation per person, right? Like that's another good risk reducer because uh, you know an attacker is likely not going to be ten thousand people. And then the the totally other possibility is like if there's some like change to staking economics that we haven't understood yet and like i mean justin is like a big fan of uh one-time signatures for example which is like right now you know utopian total far out cryptography but five years ago zk evms were utopian far out cryptography so you know like um what are one-time signatures um basically that's this quantum technique that allows you to create a um key where Essentially, it's like for every nonce, you're only able to make one signature because uh, when when you make your first signature, like that actually destroys the superposition, so you're not able to sign any other message. But what what is the significance of that? The Um, significance of that is that it makes double spending like literally, or or like like self uh, slashing inconsistency like literally impossible. Quantum slashing prevention. Yeah, but but, uh, that sounds like it's more than two years out though. Oh, it's all. <laughs> but, but but how would that impact the staking ecosystem? Oh, because like you would literally not be able to sign two conflicting blocks, and so if a block gets finalized, like whoever finalized it, they would just literally not be able to finalize something competing. So then the advantage would be there's no slashing needed, or right. well, right. The exactly. Well, that's. Or if it's uh, if it's used on chain, like, or if it's used off chain, then like you as a staker would be able to use this key scheme, and you'd be able to prove to other people that like you're not slashable, and so everyone would accept you in their pool. Okay. Yeah. But then mm-hmm. one thing to note about that scheme is like slash like self like self uh, contradiction is one way to get slashed, but the other way to lose your money is inactivity leaks, right? 
and it's kind of like sometimes making yourself uh, more defensible against one sort of like weakens your ability in the other case and yeah like it, you, you have to like make sure you have both covered okay and what do we what do we do until then so basically it sounds like you were talking about morals of the ecosystem and so on you think there should be like a social consensus that we do not do liquid staking and we do not do restaking it's a it's a good question i mean i what i would prefer to see is um i i mean i think just like tell like in the you know in a dgen heavy ecosystem just telling people not to do stuff doesn't work um on the i mean we can work harder to make versions of these things that have the properties that we want and like possibly make some trade-offs until we're ready with the technology to sort of do them fully properly but that try to provide those uh, properties right so like with one time uh, signatures for example the utopian thing is uh, the quantum stuff the um, thing today that makes uh, trade-offs would be yeah, keys and trusted hardware right and like you could imagine a yeah, system where you as a staker are only allowed to join a staking pool if you put your key in or if you prove to the thing that your key is in a trusted hardware module that prevents you from like signing two conflicting messages and in, uh, in one epoch right so like that is an option another option is to like make like look at all of the major applications of um, LSTs and basically create um, alternatives or possibly can like help the yeah, existing ones like maybe design themselves in a way that's still is taking friendly. So right now, right, um, Lido is very dominant when it comes to liquid staking, yeah. and it seems sort of their uh, strategy is you know one the view that okay liquid staking is a sort of you know winner take all type market mm -hmm. and then you know obviously Lido wants to be that winner and then to then try to sort of you know minimize the protocol and try to uh, you know minimize the role of governance and stuff like that so obviously that would be like one outcome that's possible right where like maybe that happens Lido becomes very dominant uh, and um, of course there are like other outcomes that uh, could play out when it comes to this liquid staking marketplace what do you think would be, you know, most desirable and what are some scenarios that you're worried about? Yeah, good question. I think like what the desirable outcome is, we don't, I, like I think we can admit that we don't fully know yet. Um, what the scenarios to avoid are, I mean, one is, uh, you know, if uh, Lido governance ends up uh, like dominating and like, one is like a lot of governance could get attacked, right? Um, the um, other, you know, you know the, the Lido smart contract system has a bug would be another one. Um, a yes, third would be like it's uh, like Lido governance tries uh, throwing its weight around in some kind of protocol, um, you know, decision. And I think if Lido goes one way and the, and the yeah, community goes the other way, then like, you know, the researchers are fully intent on like stamping their foot down and saying like, no, we're doing this. And uh, if 64% of the stakers disagree, but the community agrees, then like, guess what? The 64% of the stakers are just going to go in activity leak themselves, right? I think uh, there's w like within all of the people I've talked to, there's definitely a yeah, strong willingness to like say like, like let the too big to fail people fail. I mean, uh, you mean that would be like a hard fork, basically, right? Like it would not be a hard fork. Like, I, like to be clear, I don't mean like a hard fork, like targeted to like a, you know, like a burn ETH of these systems or anything, right? Like I'm against social slashing, right? I mean a yeah, hard fork. Like if there's just some, hard like hard fork on some governance issue that's controversial for other reasons, right? Like things that the community, like the community cares about that, uh, like let's say for example, if the community is. Uh, you know, more on the lunar punk side and wants to, um, pres you know, preserve the capability, you know, improve capabilities of strong privacy, improve anti-censorship and improve all of those things. And it just so happens that dominant ETH holders end up being like BlackRock types who want to like submit to the iron will of the government or whatever. And, uh, you know, a, uh, if a hard fork uh, comes along, the, if it, or, or, like some EIPs come along that are popular that where, you know, that improve the chain's censorship resistance, for example, and, uh, you know, large ETH holders are against it and they try to, like, coordinate against it by, yeah, you know, doing proof-of-stake 51% attacky stuff, then, like, 
in that case, basically, like the, you know, like they'll be ignored, right? That's uh, like I think there's a yeah, like at least in my observation, there's a strong consensus among uh, like developers, researchers, community people that I've talked to about that. So you you talked about we mentioned this briefly at the beginning, uh, decentralized social networks, and mm-hmm. you know your enthusiasm to seeing those uh, become reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of the issues there and is is the data, the potential for data data harvesting, and I I wonder if you know broadly as an ecosystem, we're I mean obviously privacy is a, is, mm-hmm. is, a, is a big component of you know crypto research, but do you think that privacy is being sufficiently prioritized hmm. in development roadmaps across all blockchains, not only for social uh, for so- social media applications, but I think there's a broader implication um, that privacy is to some extent essential for the mm-hmm. functioning of capitalism mm-hmm. uh, because capitalism yeah. exists because of the it's also asymmetry of, of information, right? It's also essential for the functioning of democracy. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are, are we Are we going... Uh, in a direction where privacy is not being prioritized enough for these things to become mainstream, it's a it's a yeah good question, and it is something that I worry about. And I mean, I've obviously been like pushing hard for privacy protocols to continue to be developed. Um, I think uh, there's definitely a yeah, big need for this stuff to happen, and like even just zooming out from beyond the crypto space, right? Like we're basically in a situation right now where stuff all around the world is being rapidly digitized. And a lot of the time, that digitization comes with uh, forms of privacy that our civilization has had for thousands of years just suddenly being erased within a decade, right? And, like, you know, we saw examples of that during COVID. There's examples of that in the context of the whole cashless society, yeah, you know, transition that a lot of governments are pushing. And, I mean, our CBDC is potentially being a yeah, part of that. Um, the way, um, you know, the proliferation of KYC for a whole bunch of uh, use cases, right? Like, there are huge amounts of, uh, you know, privacy that are very quickly being lost and no one is uh, really presenting an alternative. And I think uh, the place where the crypto community really shines is like it is in a place where it actually can provide a uh, credible alternative with, uh, you know, enough execution power to actually execute on it. But like it needs to actually do that, right? And so, examples of that are, I mean, one is obviously payments, right? Like we, you know, got to solve the most basic uh, pay- pr- payments privacy problems first. And I've been a couple of, um, I guess, you know, o- o- over the last, um, you know, couple of years, the whole tornado cash situation happens, and uh, I think there, there's a uh, in. There's definitely yeah, people who were kind of scared off from participating in um, you know, privacy protocols entirely, which I yeah. think is, uh, I mean, in some sense, it's uh, a huge um, overreaction uh, just uh, because like even, you know, if we look at the law itself, right, like there's, you know, lawsuits against the government ongoing challenging their ability to do what they did. But more generally, there's um, a, yeah, like zero knowledge proof technology creates a lot of opportunities to create privacy protocols that are are kind of even sort of stronger and better for everyone in a lot of respects, right? Like one very simple um, example of this, this is the uh, proof of innocence approach that, uh, you know, Chainway, yeah, this uh, lovely company from uh, Turkey created. And, uh, you know, I mean, Soleimani has been a fan of and lots of other companies. We are basically, yeah, when you are withdrawing from a yeah, tornado cash type system, you would be able to specify like which subset of uh, deposits your withdrawal came from, right? And you basically be able to say like, hey, I'm a participant in this scheme. And by the way, I am not one of these 35 recognized DeFi hackers. And if you do that, the, and uh, if you make that be a default, then basically almost everyone will be yeah, excluding the 35 DeFi hackers. And so, so the 35 DeFi hackers will end up actually having a much tinier anonymity set, right? And so there's techniques like this, which are being actively worked on. And I think, uh, you know, really should be working on um, on them a lot more. Um, there's uh, right now on Ethereum, this stuff is happening more at the application layer. And I think one of the big reasons not to do that on base layer right now is because we just don't know enough about the yeah, the underlying technology for it to solidify that much, mm. right? Like all these schemes, they use ZK snarks and like 
we don't even agree among the experts whether Nova is the future or whether 64-bit Goldilocks Starks are the future or whether the lookup singularity is the future, right? So like how, you know, like which technology stack are you even going to use, right? How much do you think this is a cultural problem? Because basically, I mean, yeah. you know, me, I'm I'm the eternal optimist. I think we can build almost anything if we put our minds to it. Yeah. But basically, how much do you think the average person mm -hmm. actually cares mm -hmm. about these privacy issues? Because basically, if you look at kind of the track record of kind of the revelations of the last, say, 10 mm -hmm. to 15 years, mm -hmm. it seems, I mean, there was like a little bit of an outcry at first, but then everyone kind of, it, it was yesterday's news, right? And basically now it's kind of just the status quo and uh, d d most people uh, d d do, do not feel hmm. very strongly about this. It's a good question. I mean, I feel like in some ways this kind of resignation about privacy sort of mirrors the resignation, of, the resignation toward like biological death from aging, for example, which is like people end up sort of thinking like, okay, yeah, it's fine because they don't see a viable alternative in front of them. And, uh, the, yeah, like the, like one part of that is like the alternative has to present itself and the alternative has to present itself in a way that it does not require like massive sacrifices of, uh, inconvenience, right? It's, uh, like it's, uh, you know, like it's, 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 I'm making the comparison between, uh, privacy and aging here intentionally, right? Because there's the whole, you know, Twitter, uh, s sort of, uh, meme that like oh you know these people are getting up in the morning and having their 84 minute saunas at 67.2 degrees and then eating 500 pills and then eating 325 uh, milliliters of uh, um, you know vegetable pudding and like you know you're living longer but like what kind of life do you have right and like there's a, in all, a lot of these idealistic things there is like a big dimension of like sort of turning people off by yeah sort of putting front and center the yeah options favored by the geeks that involve huge amounts of work when like we know the real solution is like for this sort of stuff to be adopted it has to be affordable in terms of money it has to be affordable in terms of time it has to be like basically automatic and the defaults right and so i am fully on board with privacy becoming automatic and the default in the ethereum ecosystem that i don't think that involves privacy being on literally on layer one because uh the de like the default isn't the chain the default is the wallets right and so if you have major wallets that support it then you know users can go and send things through privacy contracts right let's let's okay. talk about let's talk about wallets and the kind of abstraction and privacy and kind of how how to kind of so basically smart contracts and privacy is notoriously mm -hmm. difficult to kind of mm -hmm. marry yeah how, uh, but at the same time kind of smart contract mm -hmm. wallets in terms of account abstraction and so on seem mm -hmm. to be the go-to Mm. What do we do? About what do we do about what what what, what problem like um, smart contracts and digital identities? Oh, I, I see what you mean. Identity is a complicated word because it like mixes f at least four different problems into the same concept, right? So there is like identity just in the sense that I prove that like I I the entity that did this previous action some time ago also did this action, right? And that's like the most basic form of entity. That's like a, you know like a cryptographic key. Then there is identity in the sense of like, I actually attest specific things about someone else, right? You can like, this could be well of trust or you could have centralized versions of this and like the, and that starts getting into things like uh, um, government KYC, which is probably big enough that, you know, it's a, a third category. And then, you know, you have the uh, unique proof of personhood problem where you care about someone being a human and not a bot, but you don't really mind like exactly which human you are and you're trying to keep that private, right? Like there, there's this, whole range of things that people put in the yeah, identity box. Um, there's uh, uh, like, you know, a sort of uh, roots of authentication. Like, uh, you know, if you lose your account for one service, like what service do you, you do you use to recover it? And like a lot of the time that's been, um, you know, Google or Twitter or WeChat or some or, or phone numbers or some of those. And uh, in that case, centralized alternatives are actually pretty terrible, right? Like, uh, you know, there is this uh, culture of using phone numbers for things by default, but then like SIM swapping attacks happen all the time, right? And like even even these Google accounts, like uh, if you lose your passport or, pa or password, a lot of the time, like sure, if theoretically centralized services are better because you can always, um, you know, go and call the company and get it. But like in practice, I know, I've personally known people who have tried to do that and they've like literally failed, right? Uh, so... There's uh, 
I think the way that I look at this is that like we as, uh, you know, in, in the crypto space, sh like we should be ambitious in the sense of like, we're literally trying to create a separate stack, right? Like basically think like literally trying to create an alternative to the centralized tech stack to the same level of depth that like, for example, you know, in China, there is a Chinese tech stack, right? Except in this case, instead of being more centralized, it's less centralized. And um, so, you know, got to replace Google, you know, kick out Google, put in sign in with Ethereum. You got to, um, you know, replace PayPal, put in, um, you know, crypto payments. So, uh, you know, you have to put in actual, pri actual privacy solutions, replace KYC, put in like, you know, whatever your favorite proof of, hum uh, proof of humanity is, right? Um, like actually be ambitious and uh, like build that stack. Um, and identity is a yeah, big part of that. And I think that like that will be able to both solve problems within the crypto space that we sometimes use the word identity to describe, but also hopefully serve as a uh, demonstration to the uh, wider world of like, here's an example of all of these technologies kind of working together in a coherent way and solving those problems in a way that like actually does um, protect privacy. Um, so one example of this is, uh, so in, you know, Zuzulu, this uh, kind of, min, you know, pop-up mini city that we uh, did in uh, Montenegro in the spring, one of the uh, applications that we uh, worked on while there was uh, this thing called ZooPass, right? So I can uh, actually uh, take it out and uh, show it for our video um, listeners right now. Um, okay, got to switch to my profile because that's uh, on Graphene OS that t uh, takes... Uh, five seconds, but it's still uh, much more uh, convenient than I expected. Open up the app, zoopass.org, and one, two, circle rotating, and this is a QR code. This QR code is a zero knowledge proof, like it is a ZK snark. I believe Groth 16, but I'm not, not exactly sure, could be a plug proof or something else too. And this proof proves that I am one of the residents of Zuzulu without revealing which one, right? And this is all done like within this nice, really convenient application. Like it has a QR code and, um, you know, people like even just, uh, you know, like security guards with uh, like one hour of training or less, like they can, you know, go and scan it and verify it. Um, you can, uh, there is an online component. You can use this to log into websites. There is a system called Zoo Poll where you could use this to do anonymous voting. So like only people authorized by the system can vote, but you can only... Like, but you can't, t nobody, not even the operator of the system can tell who vote, like, like which specific person made which specific vote because like ZK snarks are kind of break that link, but they at the same, but they preserve the property that only authorized people can vote and voters can only vote once, right? And like, this is basically like, you can think of it as a small scale e-government solution, right? And this was applied to like, of about like 500 people. And then once you go up from there, then the next step is, well, can we, yeah, you know, apply something like this at Ethereum conference ecosystems, and then it's 10,000. And then can we go up from there? And uh, I mean, we'll talk about small countries and get up to a million, right? And so there is, I think, an opportunity for the yeah, community to try to work together and like actually demonstrate this whole um, stack working. And like, I think to be clear, like this is not going to happen just because of um, economic incentives. And this is not going to happen because like, like, I'm not expecting, like, literally, yeah, you know, like, more than 50% or even more than, like, 5% of uh, even ETHCC attendees to be willing to, like, put significant amounts of effort into, um, you know, the kind of, you know, bearing, like, highly inconvenient applications just because, um, you know, this stuff is cool and ideologically important, right? I'm expecting, you know, groups of developers who do tend to be passionate about all of these causes to build things um, and uh, for, you know, the ecosystem to adopt it. And, um, you know, once uh, these kinds of things become adopted and once uh, these kinds of things become default, then, you know, more and more people can start participating. And, like, it's not just a... Uh, um, that kind of accept annoyance because you value privacy that much thing, right? It's also a cultural thing. It's like, uh, you know, we we do need to, I think, make like all of these uh, privacy solutions like a yeah, really, yeah, you know, important and like cool part of uh, the good side of uh, of crypto culture, right? So like this is uh, 
one of the things I'm hoping to see happen. And then, you know, at the same time in the in the protocol with payments, um, there's a huge amount of technical work that's left. And uh, a lot of this stuff is only viable on L2 because of transaction fees. And so users have to actually move to, uh, to, to layer two. But, you know, fortunately, a lot of these privacy systems are already launching on layer two is now. Um, so it's, uh, it feels like things are moving in a good direction and it feels like there is momentum, but like that momentum definitely needs to be created and maintained. And if the people who could maintain that, that momentum don't, then like things, this could very easily slide into being a, lo uh, a lost opportunity, which would be, uh, you know, really tragic. And uh, like we too could totally end up being in a no privacy world 15 years from now. So hopefully we don't. So, um, yeah, you, you're talking about Zuzalu, and I guess this sort of mm. alludes to the larger topic, mm. or at least one way of, I guess, phrasing this is this sort of kind of network state mm. type idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned uh, this identity thing as kind of like one experiment that's happening there. I'm curious, like, what are some other experiments happening in this area that you think are really promising? Yeah, so I think, I mean... Well, there's a lot of things that are valuable in or that like could be done in like these things like Zosolo, like basically, yeah, like the category is kind of communities that start online and then uh, materialize offline, right? Which could be temporary, could even be permanent, right? Um, is uh, that there's just a lot of things that become easier to do when there is a yeah, community that is uh, like an actual in person community that does all of them together, right? I mean, the easiest example of this, I think, is universities, right? Like, uh, people have been excited about, like, using Coursera to displace um, in-person universities for, like, 15 years, right? I mean, I remember when the first MOOCs were coming out, like, I literally participated in the very first ones on uh, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence right, by uh, Sebastian Thrun and Andrew Eng, right? And, like, I think 10 years later, like, that's partially happens, but there's still a large extent to which it hasn't. And like, there's definitely an extent to which part of that is just, uh, you know, the old world being credentialist and there being all kinds of slow moving policies that favor old stuff. But there is definitely like a large component of this, which is that like, well, actually, you know, in-person learning has all kinds of um, advantages, right? Like it's, uh, you know, this sort of like very disciplinary kind of, um, uh, you know, environment. It's an environment where, like, everyone around you is, um, you know, pursuing the same cause. It's uh, the sort of thing that, uh, you know, if a yeah, journalist uh, from uh, Mars uh, would come in and possibly describe as a cult, and yet at the same time, it's, like, super effective uh, in a lot of contexts that actually teaching people, right? And, you know, like, if you're having trouble with uh, problem number 17, you could, um, you know, go talk to your friend uh, or go talk to your professor, and those options just, like, exist by default. Right. And so like that's one sort of pro proto example. Another good proto example is uh, Linux, um, especially back in the yeah, good old days of the 90s, like, you know, before it started uh, like really yeah, trying this kind of mainstream path and, uh, you know, getting Ubuntu adopted and all of those things. It's uh, like Linux was intense and you needed to be intense to be a Linux person. Right. But they had like these often in-person user groups in many cities. And like if you have a problem and, you know, if you're earnestly trying to become a Linux person, like, you could just go and, like, they'd actually help you figure things out, right? And so I think creating environments like that, like environments and environments where things can be tested out, like, not just, um, you know, separate individuals, but, like, actually inside of a community and you could actually kind of, you know, run through the full workflow and... Uh, Make sure that like everything works right. So like similar to how you know we used like Zoopass and Zoopol, right? Like it's not just a bunch of separate people that are like, ooh, ah, I can vote on things. It's like you have an actual community where people make polls, people vote on polls, people talk about the results of the polls. Things happen because of the results of the polls. Um, if uh, you know something spicy happens in the polls, people know about it and talk about it, right? And like you get this sort of much more holistic picture of. Uh, you know, like all of the good things, um, all of the bad things, all of the yeah, frustrating things. As um, you know, I try to open up the yeah app, and um, you know, it take a few months ago, and it would take like fifteen seconds to actually load the QR code, and uh, it wasn't fa like, fast enough for me to actually yeah, 
Like I had to wait beside the uh, security guard to verify it. And then uh, I basically complained. And then like, you know, like two, uh, two days later, they're like, oh yeah, like, you know, we used the, yeah, uh, like some, some of the newer browser technology now, and now things load much more quickly and it did. Right. And so I think ZooPass is like the beginning. Like I would love to try out a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Like we need to make pr crypto payments come back. Right. Like you remember back in 2013, there was uh, a lot, this big enthusiasm about Bitcoin payments. Like when I started my Bitcoin nomading tour, well, when I was visiting the uh, you know northeastern U.S., mainly New Hampshire, because all of the fun libertarians were there, but like also Boston, there were exactly two places that accepted Bitcoin. There was a uh, Thelonious Monkfish and the Veggie Galaxy. I'm not sure whether these two still accept Bitcoin or even still exist, right? But there's like you know like, there, like I would do you know like, took pilgrimages to both of these places. I took pilgrimages to many Bitcoin accepting restaurants. In Berlin, there was this thing called Bitcoin Keats, where basically they convinced a whole bunch of restaurants in a small region of Kreuzberg to accept Bitcoin at the same time. And like we'd go on pilgrimages to Room 77, which was uh, the most famous one of these. Um, I think actually the founder there is Room 77. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it's closed. Cluster. Right, it's closed now, right? But I think, was it even the one who started that whole thing? He was, yeah. Yeah, yeah and like I that my was, first Bitcoin there. It's not crazy. Like that was like super cool, right? Like I want to. And, and the first mobile wallet, right, in Bitcoin was basically created by this guy because he, yeah, exactly, because he wanted to pay with his phone in 277. Yeah. Yeah, like, so that stuff is, like, cool. And I feel like now that we have layer twos and, like, cheap payments are, again, on the horizon. And, uh, you know, the, the benchmark I gave that the internet ended up, uh, you know, memorializing of... of uh, you know, that the internet of money should not cost more than five cents a transaction. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, first people thought that it's a joke. And, uh, you know, now it's like, hey, yeah. Actually, even back in 2020, um, Loopring made a yeah, payment-specific ZK rollup where the transaction fee actually was lower than five cents, right? Because if you make something payment-specific, you can make it really simple. And you can only, you can do a compression, like use indices, and you can make payments be only like 16 bytes total. And like, that's only a tiny amount of call data, right? So... Like, yeah, like, I want to do, like, more of these cool things and, like, have communities to be able to do more of these cool things and, like, really, yeah, you know, progress and level up on this stuff, like, much faster and, and better. Did you see the Gnosis Pay announcement? I did not. So please tell me about it. <laughs> so, basically, it's a way to kind of connect the Visa card to a self-custodial wallet. Mm -hmm. And, basically, um, you custody until you tap wherever Visa is accepted. Mm -hmm. And it takes it right, right out of your wallet. Um, okay. at that point and so basically it's it's kind of it's mm. infrastructure so we're mm -hmm. we're issuing um, cards ourselves it's uh, it's the Gnosis card yeah, no. but also um, mm. we are offering this as a service to other wallets so mm. say one inch can offer one inch card mm. Zerion can offer Zerion card Metamask can offer M Metamask card mm -hmm. and it's a way to kind of make your funds accessible mm -hmm. um, in, in the larger world uh, because, I mean, crypto is super self-referential, right? So basically, be because yeah. it's difficult to kind of on and off ramp and then kind of, uh, yeah, just, I didn't I, I didn't intend to shit it here. But, but you, you know, forgot the part, you forgot the really cool part, which is that if the payment terminal accepts Gnosis Pay, the payment is a crypto payment. Yeah, so basically what you what payment. you can do is you can you can do like a native P2B mm -hmm. transfer. So it's... Uh, yeah, no, 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 I think that's uh, super cool. Um, I don't know, we, we, we should do more of it. <laughs> Let, let's maybe talk a little bit about the broader ecosystem. Sure. Uh, as we uh, before we wrap up here, you know, I I, I gave this talk yesterday about uh, interoperability between uh -huh. Ethereum and other ecosystems, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were there were some conversations also and some debates uh, about you know, layer twos versus multi chain. You know, where do you see the where do you see things going uh, from the perspective of you know um, the mm -hmm. layer two thesis versus a you know app chain Cosmos like thesis. And uh, what are the biggest challenges to interoperability that uh, need to be solved? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like good to sort of talk a bit separately about like chains and ecosystems, right? Like uh, there's uh, like Bitcoin is uh, an ecosystem that basically has like Bitcoin and like maybe liquid, right? And then Ethereum is, uh, you know, has Ethereum and then everything which... Uh, aspires to be in the same security zone as Ethereum, which, um, you know, it means that, like, it reverts if Ethereum reverts or or it doesn't make progress until Ethereum finalizes. And, uh, you know, it would have to hard fork if Ethereum hard forks and all of those things. Um, and then there is, like, 
other ecosystems and um you know it seems like cosmos is trying to be an ecosystem and like do a lot of shared security and it feels to me like there's like i do expect consolidation between ecosystems right like i don't expect you know the yeah there to be like a large number of uh meaningful like totally independent things happening i yeah i mean i i do expect um you know there to be a, a lot of like chain interop happening within cosmos just because like that's what you know cosmos promotes as a way for of uh like moving around cosmos land and uh talking to things i yeah i mean the main the main technical differences between these are i mean obviously one of them is just like security especially in more extreme circumstances like if a 51 percent attack does happen right it's like how much breaks um and then another one uh would um you know yeah like on the flip side be like okay well what happens if one of these things makes a governance decision and like does one making a governance decision mean imply a cascade of other governance decisions or does that mean that there needs to be a, a, some kind of multi-sig bridge that sort of relays the uh, governance decision to other ecosystems and like these different properties have different trade-offs i guess right um and yeah like you have it's like you could have more adaptability or you could have more shared security or you could uh, find ways to move a little bit more on the shared security spectrum but then that ends up like sacrificing a little bit of adaptability i think it's uh i mean it's it's an interesting technical discussion um though i yeah also think that you know like only part of the problem is technical like the mm -hmm. other part of the problem is uh just a yeah a question of like which ecosystems are you know successfully able to survive and uh, grow over time and i, th I think one, yeah. one one interesting thing that uh, i've been thinking about a lot and, and, I, and mm -hmm. i'm trying to sort of mm -hmm. predict where things will happen is currently the interoperability discussion is very much happening i think mm -hmm. at the lower protocol layer and the state layer right and if you look at the way so you mentioned linux earlier like the way interoperability happened between mac os windows and 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 linux wasn't really at the application layer it happened because of the web we right. we we created interoperability of applications at, yeah. at a higher layer of the stack. And I okay. wonder if mm. this uh, this vision that we have for interoperability, the IBC-like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. state, like state cross-chain state verification and right, transport right. layer actually yeah. is what ends up happening, or if we just end up having interoperability at the smart contract layer, right, higher right. application layer on the I guess I've kind of, uh, I mean, I did literally kind of make a similar point one and a half years ago, right, where I basically argued against bridges and in favor of, and against, um, you know, the whole concept of assets homed on in one security zone being used in other security zones and in favor of like just uh like having dexes right and i think that's uh you know totally fine um yeah like in general i think it's uh like we don't want to you know create links that end up turning into something ugly if like something on one side of the other or the other goes badly right and in like i think there's a lot of value that you could get from that kind of oper interoperability right and the question is almost like well you know like, what do you even not get right like you could say yeah you know it's like okay fine you know every asset is homed in one ecosystem and if you want to use it in that ecosystem then like you like you need to go have an actual client of that ecosystem but that's fine like right like we yeah there's there's multi-chain wallets so there's uh like as soon as wallets of any of these ecosystems become standardized and become libraries, like someone's going to wallet that just have a wallet that includes a copy of all of them, right? And then if you want to move to one to, from one to the other, you use a DEX. And if you want to use a DeFi thing, there'll just be a copy of every important thing in each one of those ecosystems, and that's fine, right? Like that's uh, in 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 a lot of ways, I think it's a a totally okay way to do things. Um, but do you think that's the way that we see happen? Good question. I think, uh, let's see, what I, what what do I think? Um, I do think that, like, the ongoing instances of crazy hacks of uh, bridges are what... My guess is that they're turning huge amounts of people off from that concept, right? Um, and, uh, I mean, obviously there could be... Yeah, there could be different black swans in the future and there could be a black swan, like, on the, you know, layer two side, for example, right? But, it's, uh, like, the... Yeah, I I definitely get the impression right now that like people are, 
you know, more skittish about holding their funds in complicated constructions than they were before, just like because of, uh, you know, how many of these weird $180 million incidents we've seen. But uh, I guess we'll see. I, I, I'm totally with you that we need better yeah. bridge infrastructure. That goes without saying. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so basically we, we, we're kind of close to the event of kind of like, mm -hmm. I mean, we have trust minimized bridges. We will mm -hmm. probably have like trustless bridges, bridges like sooner -ish. Um, would that in your mind change things? Because basically, right. if you look at kind of the bridge exploits that, that we've seen in the last year and a half or so, mm -hmm. only a minority of them would have actually been prevented from the mm -hmm. the um, the networks actually being in L2, right? So basically, those are mostly the compromised, compromised keys um, kind of situations, not the right. smart contract uh, bugs. Yeah, I mean, bug risk is definitely an, uh, one of the issues. And then, I mean, the other issue, of course, is like, if you have a, uh, like, even if you have a uh, ZK bridge, like, that's between, or I guess, a, like, like a Sonark validity proof of consensus bridge or whatever, right? Like, that still creates the possibility that there is, like, a 51% attack on one of these systems that actually leads to stealing coins, right? And, like, when you have a uh, VC chain or whatever where, like, half the coins are literally controlled by four people, then, like, there, the difference between that and a multi-sig becomes more of just kind of being nearly philosophical, right? So this is, uh, I mean, like this sort of stuff is less of a problem between big ecosystems and it's more of a problem between small ecosystems, right? It's kind of like how, uh, like sometimes, you know, we like to trust that, you know, like, oh, if there's governance, then like surely governance is like going to at least be fine. And then like a year ago, there was that incident where there was like literally an $80 million hack within a flash loan because somebody borrowed a bit of money and then used that to buy up half of a governance token and then voted to give themselves the treasury and they made like a huge amount of profit, right? Uh, so yeah, I guess, uh, you know, we'll see. And I'm glad that like that technology is uh, being developed. Though, of course, we do need to, you know, also be realistic about timelines and like, you know, be realistic about like when we actually hand, you know, hand over the keys and, um, you know, when we, yeah, have the power to do upgrades and like all of these things, but we'll see. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Vitalik, for joining us today. It's been really fantastic to talk with you again. And in this, you know, special moment here in Paris with ECC, I'm super excited to see, you know, how Ethereum is going to develop in the next few years. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you guys too. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that was interesting with Vitalik. What yeah. do you guys think? I mean, it's it's always interesting um, interviewing Vitalik. I I feel like I could have asked him questions for like another hour. Um, but yeah, I'm very grateful that we get to have this time with him. It's like, yeah, it's pretty cool that we get to sit down with him. So yeah, thanks for setting this up. I didn't get to ask any questions. I could also do another hour. <laughs> but yeah. So for those who don't know, this is Mr. Joseph Schweitzer from the Ethereum Foundation. And one time Epicenter co-host. Twice if you count the DevCon 6 rap. Yeah. Okay. Like, hey. And if you count this one, it's the third. Yeah. Yeah. That was. It's a charm. <laughs> <laughs> but the weeks are very long, you know? So it's, it's um, these things have changed a lot, but at the same time, it's nice to see what, uh, uh, you know, what is surviving and what is thriving. So if it gets harder to do these, it means more people keep showing up. But the, you started off the interview by saying there's more buildings, there's more days. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see that even in, you know, what the rest of the world considers a lull, we have this. Uh, yeah, it's a weird bear market. It, it's like, I, I remember like the 2015 bear market, like you know, when we went to Berlin and we were at that second Bitcoin conference that they had in Berlin and like compared to the one that they had just before it, it was so dead and the enthusiasm was at zero mm. and, you know, obviously there's been other cycles since then, but I just always go back at that that moment where like, this conference room was just filled with uh, people that just were not enthusiastic about it, about what was going on versus what happened to the year before. And, and this is not really that sort of in that sort of situation. But, but this is a builder conference, right? So basically if you go to business conferences, sure. I think it's slightly different. And also it, when you talk with the builders in depth, a lot of them fear the pain that it's really difficult to raise right now. So basically yeah. I've heard this, Time and time again this time. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think sort of this 
situation is right that there's still though there was a lot of money in the space and of course people are motivated they keep building so even though it's a bear market right there's a lot of what Vitalik said right a lot of technical progress a lot of work that's being done and now of course I guess there is a question what is going to happen right because I think we saw you know there's recently people showing like statistics about the funding from VC funds right which is down something like basically to almost nothing right so from uh, like 95% or something, right? So basically the, the crypto VC funds are raising basically no money. And then of course, that will now trigger like, you know, what, what you said, right? Much harder fundraising re- environment. And that of course, you know, with the lack that people have, whatever, maybe two years runway. So I, I do think that, right, if this bear market does continue, right, another year and another two years, then I think it, could very well get super hard. I mean, if as a startup you have two years of runway, you're actually in a very comfortable situation. I've actually spoken with lots of people who say, look, we're running out of money this quarter. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, two years of runway is maybe after fundraising, right? But maybe how how long are you in? And and of course, not everyone has that situation yeah. either. There was, um, you mentioned this 2015 sort of Bitcoin cycle. It's very interesting to see what is fluff, um, pure speculation, versus what is a little bit more in the way of substance. Because when hype goes away, but it was nothing but a speculative ecosystem, then the rest of it also goes away. And I think one of the key differences between that time, 15, 16, and what we saw in, let's say, 18, 19, was even as the world moved on from this ICO era, those conferences, those research conferences, started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And just like this, uh, uh, uh-uh. What's interesting about this is that, okay, I come from this organization that, that doesn't organize this conference. ETH France does ETH CC and ETH Denver is doing the you know thing in Denver and Global does the global thing. There's a venture that does Lisbon and uh, uh, apparently posted Prague and on and on and on and on. And you know here we start to see these different verticals start to grow on their own. The ZK folks and the enterprise people and It's less fluff. It's not, you know, there's an NFT conference followed by a DeFi thing and that's kind of it. Mm. And this is where I think you can tell that there are enough in the way of planted seeds that there will be substance to follow. It's just, there's a a matter of patience to get there based on how far you figuratively fell because of a lot of some of the funny business that goes on when there's too much attention on the industry, money included. Yeah, I mean... Patience is the key, I think, right now. I mean, like we're we're raising a fund, and much like the crypto companies that are having a hard time raising, we're you know we're have we have some traction because we're in an ecosystem that uh, you know obviously in Cosmos that has a lot of yeah. uh, a lot of interest. But it's it's not easy to, to raise. But like counter that to like look at all these sponsors. Yeah, you know. But there's they, there's a lot of um, like this guy. Yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, all these John? people are paying, and I mean we're organizing the Nebula Summit next week. There. We, we we were able to fund the conference and like make a little bit of money. Like people, teams are reluctant to sponsor, but they're still interested in sponsoring. One thing that I think a lot of people hope is different. Uh, 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 the next time that the world chooses to pay attention uh, to this industry is that some of those resources stay with substance. You know, as we go around, I've been telling a funny story for the last you know day of the folks that do tend to find help are really notable ones that, that you know, we hope get that funding. So maybe as things get quieter and the ones that are still able to bootstrap uh, builders themselves come from build land, uh, uh, the things that can, yeah, not just survive but thrive are also uh, from a place of substance. That's the hope at least. We all want to see it get to a point where the next time, again, the world pays attention, we're not embarrassed after the fact that we can start to do some of the substantive things that we want to do. Cool. So lightning round. Favorite moments at ECC this year? Those moments where I wasn't running around to divert meetings. <laughs> you had those moments? <laughs> no, I, actually, I think I want to say the highlight, because I didn't go to many side events and I didn't see very range talks. But of a few things that I did this week, the Gnosis event, on the Eiffel Tower it was very nice. Aww. And the uh, Gnosis Pay announcement was, uh, a, I think, a really, like, it's a great milestone, it, it, you know, that, that we have bridged the, te- the technological gap, you know, but also there's probably like lots of regulatory gaps that you guys have bridged in order to make that happen. So, yeah, congratulations. It's a 
really, really cool to see that. Well, thank you. I can't, I can't wait to get a card. <laughs> <laughs> what about you two? Oh, one thing that was nice is I did a talk yesterday. It's the first time doing a talk here, which was sort of about Orbit, uh, which was which was nice. Uh, yeah. And then otherwise, it's just had a, yeah, I enjoyed quite a few talks. Uh, I think the talks I saw were all, were all great. I think the content in general it seems to have been like, you know, really good. And then, yeah, otherwise, it's a, a lot of things around staking. And um, I think that's, there's a lot going on, right? Uh, I think it's bear market or not, right? There's so much work to do. Yeah. And you? Highlight. I you can't say your own event, though. No, that's that's right. Um, I actually really like the new venue setup. So, I, I mean, this building's always kind of where it's been at. But basically, the upstairs stories, they were always, like, less uh, less well laid out because there's no air conditioning and so on. But I think now the venue around, this, uh, around the corner with um, the garden and basically where you can sit under the trees and um, the cloisters, and, and I love it. I absolutely love it. So I never grow up. I always want to uh, 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 collect the most interesting swag. So uh, 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 this is point one. But an actual conference programming thing, I also wasn't able to get to many talks, but one thing that I hadn't seen done before was a lightning debate room. So those were, I was, I was in one of those. Yeah. You just put super fun, you know, what's a lightning debate. You take two people that, uh, put us in a room for uh, a 15 minute period and then say, you know, what is a more decentralized ecosystem? Do cosmos versus gnosis chain. And, uh, uh, then the crowd has to cheer after the fact for who won. One of them clears out the next two come in and you debate the next thing. That is it's hilarious. fun. I would like to see that done at another conference. And we're going to do that at Nebula. I, I take notes for DAPCON here. So it's, uh, yeah, we, need more debates. we need like, we need more spice. I mean, like you know, panels, uh, one of the things about ECC is they don't, you know, they famously don't do panels and like Zero Home has a policy about no panels, but I think debates uh, are a really good alternative to panels. Yes. This is also one thing. So basically I think panels, they kind of, they stand and fall with the host and whether they can kind of poke the attendees in kind of just the right, right way to kind of make them kind of, uh, you know, to pitch them against one another because you want to make them fight. Right. So basically, if everyone kind of gets to say their bit, it's a bit boring. So it's, uh, it's like hockey. It's only interesting until the glove comes off. Absolutely. Cool. All right, so well, until next year. Yeah. Next at year at ECC7. Thanks so much for listening. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.